Uh, for those of you who've attended uh, Lewis's talk yesterday on JWT, there will be some overlap, maybe like 30% overlap. <laughs> uh, it's all good, right? There, there'll be uh, some uh, back to basics for you, but there will be some other stuff as well. Right? So I'll, I'll talk about uh, JWT, what it is, why it is used, but also different ways you can do it wrong. Um, some of the security hacks, well-known hacks um, against uh, JWT tokens, but also some best practices. Uh, that's just about me. So yes, I am an OWASP member. I'm, um, uh, I'm mostly, most of my work is in API security, in REST APIs. Uh, I am a, a curator of apisecurity.io community site. So if you're interested in REST API security, that's a, a news and newsletter. So you're welcome to, to use it. So that's a little bit of self-promotion. Uh, and then I also work for 42 Crunch, which is an API security company. And uh, I'm one of the contributors to OWASP um, API security top 10. So that's a new uh, OWASP project that just got released. Literally, uh, December 31st, uh, 2019 is when we released to be a 2019 list. <laughs> <laughs> so you are very welcome to, again, use that list and contribute to that project. Anyway. Uh, so, uh, a little bit back to basics. Why, why do we care about tokens, what tokens are? Because JWT is a JSON web token. What is a token, right? So, uh, and again, that, that's going to be basic for a lot of you, uh, but bear with me for half a, half a minute for those who, who are not, uh, who don't know auth and etc. So, the, the, main, the main reason we need tokens is that we have a user, right? So, that's, that's you, a consumer who wants to use their mobile app or something. Uh, and we have that mobile app or web app or something that needs to work on behalf of that user. And there's probably some sort of a uh, resource API with which that app needs to work, right? So that, that's the fundamental problem. And then, so you need to get this app to work with this resource. So the traditional way is just, let's give this app username and password. And the problem with that is that this resource will now not know that this is an app. They, for, for, for that resource, any app that is working on, on your behalf is going to look exactly like you. Right? That there's no way for the resource, like that, that app gets full access, full power to do anything it wants on behalf of you. And it's okay if it's sort of a legitimate app, but you never know. Right? So if you give app, each and every app in the world access to your whatever, to your email uh, backend, then any app can do anything, they can leak, uh, leak your credentials, and there's no way to say, I don't no longer want this app to do anything, because you can only do that by removing access for everything, by changing your password. So it's, it's a very bad way. It's basically all or nothing approach. So usernames and passwords are, are bad in terms of delegating that access. So that the whole idea of tokens is that Let's, let's give that delegation ability. And the whole idea behind OAuth is that instead of username and passwords, we'll just give some tokens. So the way that it works, and as again, I'll, I'll show it as an example using um, code grant. There are a few different OAuth grant types, but it doesn't matter. It's not, a, it's not an OAuth talk. It's basically user, like I want this app to do something on my behalf. So I, I tell this app, well, I, I want to log in. The app doesn't know me, the app cannot uh, log me in, but the app knows someone who knows me, identity provider, uh, and that's what you see if you log in with Facebook, for example. It's very explicit, right, that the app redirects you to Facebook, so you see that it's a different thing. But even within one system, it could be some other service. So the, the app redirects you, then this identity provider directly asks for a username and password, right, so that, that client app doesn't see that. You just talk directly to whatever, whoever is authenticating you. And that's actually very good because whatever two-factor authentication on anything that is implemented here just works, right? So you can get authenticated with anything. Say username, password, then your second factor, whatever. Uh, so you, you authenticate and then you um, often see that consent screen. I want to grant whatever ability to post to Facebook or ability to see my email address or something, right? So there's a consent screen. You say yes. I, I allow that, and then this thing sends back now to that client app, sends off an authorization code, which is some unique ID saying, yes, this, this authentication got through. And then this thing, the, this, this client app then 
sends that authentic authorization code along with its own credentials, right? So app itself can have some credentials. So now this identity provider knows that this app is a legitimate authorized app and it knows that the user has authenticated. So it knows that the user is legitimate and that the app is legitimate. And it sends you the token, right? And then this token is what the app can use to access the APIs, right? So that, that all, this is auth. And this is why the, 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 this part of it is what we're going to be talking about, right? But that, that's the overall context, why tokens are needed and why tokens are so prevalent, why all application and API authentication these days is most of it, whatever, 99% is, is token-based, right? So we, we have that usernames and passwords and second factor authentication and all of that good stuff is being used when humans are involved in that initial phase once the human has agreed to delegate some access and control, it's all just tokens, right? So that, that's gonna be the, the content of the session is, uh, is that gonna be that, that thing. Oh, and obviously API response, response hopefully. <laughs> anyway, and tokens can be anything, right? So basically, actually auth standard doesn't say anything about tokens. So that's, that's an interesting thing, like the, the way that auth as a standard has been implemented it doesn't say what tokens are. It can be whatever, right? This is some sort of unique user idea that I've generated for this uh, PowerPoint. Can be anything. And actually, Oath Center doesn't, doesn't say how that, uh, if we go back, how that resource then figures out if it's a legitimate token or not, right? So that token gets sent, and then resource needs to figure out is it legit or not. For example, I could potentially have some sort of a database to which identity provider writes that unique string and saying, well, if someone comes with this string, this is, it's whatever, it's John or Jenny. And then this uh, API could use the same database to look up and see, yeah, that, that's Jenny. Something like that. So the, the standard doesn't say anything. However, uh, people thought, okay, so why do I need that database? I have the ability to just send some information in that token. If token can be anything, why don't I just send the, 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 the identity of that Jenny right in the token? Makes sense, right? I, I can send in the token, I can say, yes, this, this is Jenny. And in that case, you don't need that shared database. You don't need that identity provider and that resource to have anything in common. They can be completely decoupled if I just put everything, all the information in the request. So that's, and obviously the, the, the easiest way these days to put something to put some information is in JSON. And that's just for purely pragmatic reasons. For developers, JSON is easy. All modern programming languages and frameworks have built-in JSON support. You can easily serialize to JSON, deserialize to JSON. Unlike XML, JSON can easily, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between JSON and objects. You can create objects based on JSON. You cannot based on XML. So JSON is very easy. It, it's compact, it's human readable, it's serializable, it has support everywhere. So that, that's why people are using JSON. And what, that's why tokens, most of the time, are JSON web tokens, or JWT or JOT, whatever way you prefer to, to call them. Uh, yeah, that's it. And so the, the most common use cases, again, auth, most auth implementations would use JSON uh, web tokens. Uh, OpenID Connect, uh, it's a standard based on, for authentication based on uh, auth, and it is, it actually, so in that standard, actually, they, they are prescribing to use uh, JWT tokens, so they, for sure. Or any JSON payload, anything that you want to give to someone with the information and you want to encrypt it or sign it, again, you can use uh, JWT tokens. They, they don't have to be used to just uh, authenticate and authorize, you can use them whenever you need to send data over. Um, and so to send them, so sending JSON within uh, HTTP request, not as a payload, but as a header or URL is, is not convenient and actually not possible because there's only some uh, characters that you can have in URLs. So again, the easiest way to do that is to encode that. So whenever you see something like that in the request, uh, authorization header, say in bearer, and then some kind of sequence like that, most likely, this is a JWT token that is encoded. 
right? So basically to make it compact and to make sure that it only has allowed characters, we use uh, base64 URL encoding. It's a standard process. Um, so you just, again, you encode it. It becomes compact. It becomes something that can be sent in URL or in um, header. And most of the time it gets sent, if you use it for within OAuth and for authentication, you send it in the authorization header and uh, in the, and it's the bearer authorization. Bearer meaning that whoever bears that token, whoever has it, can use it, right? So it's, it's basically it's like uh, people like to compare it uh, to, uh, to cash, right? So whoever has $100 can use those $100, can come to and, and then buy something at a kiosk. Right, so it's, it's the same thing. Whoever has that thing is, can, can use it to authenticate. Uh, the important thing that we'll talk about later in this uh, session, and we'll talk about a lot, is that this thing, it's not an encryption. Right, so this thing, it's, it's an open algorithm that anyone can use to decrypt your token, to, to, de to decode your token. It's not encrypted. And it can be signed, but can, can, might not be signed. Again, we will talk about that. It's just, just encoding. And so how do you know, in that case, how do you know that the token that you got here, like how, how would that resource know that it, what it got from that client is an actually a token that it can trust, that, that came through from that identity provider, right? Because basically, uh, this thing, as you can see in the diagram, this API, this resource, it doesn't talk to the identity provider at all. It only talks to the client. So if the client is a rogue client, if it's some sort of an attacker pretending to be you or pretending to be a legitimate application, then how does it know that it can trust the data that gets sent? Because remember, we've decoupled it. With, that the whole reason for using JWT tokens is to decouple it from the provider. And so the obvious way is that you, you sign that, right? You use, you use cryptography. And so uh, you get identity provider that um, has that, that JSON that it wants to, to, uh, to let the application use. It calculates a JSON, puts whatever data about you that it, it wants to put. Uh, then it calculates the signature and, and it appends it to the token and it uses the key uh, specific to that identity provider. And your resource knows that um, uh, that key, and it knows that it can trust that identity provider, so it can verify the, the signature. Um, for the client, so again, uh, from OAuth perspective, so OAuth as a standard, it says that the, uh, that the token needs to be opaque to the client. So for client, client doesn't need to know what's in the token, right? Client just takes the token and, and passes it. So the client actually doesn't, doesn't care, it doesn't, doesn't verify, it doesn't do anything, it just passes it alone, whatever it got. But the resource can uh, verify the signature. So let's talk about the, the signing process. So obviously, well not, not obviously, but the, the resource needs to know what it needs to use to verify that signature. It needs to know what kind of algorithm is used, what kind of key is used, and so on. So either you need to um, agree on that in advance, or you need to pass that information. And so in, uh, uh, in JWT tokens, in JSON Web tokens, they, they've decided that they will be adding to that payload a header that would tell what is in there, uh, what kind of data is being transfer, uh, tr transferred, and what kind of signature is being used. So in most cases, the type of the data will be JWT, but not necessarily so. You can obviously just sign and send any, any application-specific data. You can whatever sign and, and send an image. Uh, the, the standard is, is fine with that, and the, and the algorithm. So it, it takes that header in which it puts the information, and it just uses base64 encoding to encode that. Um, and let, let's talk about the, have the parameters a little bit. So there's a set of uh, algorithms that you can use. Uh, you can, uh, actually the standard uh, allows you for like debugging purposes to not use uh, any signing at all. You can use, um, in, uh, symmetric and asymmetric uh, algorithms, and there, there's a set of them in the RFC. You can uh, send a key in the header. So you can say this has been signed with this key. So for example, you have your private key with which you sign, and the public key you just send, 
you can send it in the, in the token so the people just get your token. Uh, or you can specify URL to that key, right? So you can, you say, I've signed it with my private key and for a public key, here's the URL or here's the, here's the exact key. Uh, if you have multiple keys, you can just say, here's the identifier, use key number five or whatever. Again, it can be anything. The standard doesn't say what is, what kind of identifier. Whatever, some sort of identifier that would tell the other one, use, you know our set of keys, use whatever, the, the key number five or the key X, Y, Z or whatever. Um, and then again, for public, uh, for uh, asymmetric keys, you can obviously have the, uh, the chain of certificates uh, for, the, for the private key. So again, you can send information about that uh, right in the header. So these, these are all related to them. And again, you can, we, we talked about uh, the, the media type. And sometimes the JSONs um, can be um, multi-level. So again, there's an extra header that can uh, let you know, okay, this is a JSON, but within it there's some other, some other media type. So you can do that. And it's extensible, so you can add your own, you can add your own headers, and you can use that uh, crit, critical set to say, for this header, um, I will also be sending these extra uh, headers and the client needs to know who they are and they need, it needs to be able to process them. So basically that's the set of, again, they, they are all optional, but that, that's what you send or can send to tell, tell the API uh, what to use, how to, how to check your, your token. Anyway, so let, let's get back to that. So we, we created that header, we listed the algorithm, we've encoded that. Then we have our, whatever, our payload. So say our application wants to send some information about me. So it took my, whatever, Twitter handle and, and everything. It, it mentioned that I'm not an admin, whatever it wants. Uh, and uh, it encodes that as well, right? Again, same, same algorithm, just base64 encoding. Then it, it simply appends them. So it, it takes the encoded header, adds a dot, uh, takes the, the encoded payload. And then it calculates the signature using that algorithm and again uses a dot thing. So in most cases, if you look at JWT tokens, that's what they're gonna be, that's gonna they look like. They, they'll have two dots. Uh, they, will, uh, they will all start with uh, uh, EYJ, just because that's the encoding of the opening curly brackets and the, and the quotes. So they are very easy. It's very easy to, to see that yes, that's a, that's an uh, encoded signed uh, JWC token. Uh, there is a way in the standard to send something like this when you have multiple different signatures and you can in, um, sign different parts of your JSON with different signatures and send them all, but that is very rarely used. In fact, uh, OpenID Connect doesn't support that at all. They explicitly say that you cannot use that so it, it's, it's very rarely used. In, in most cases, whatever, 99.9%, .9%, I think, well, everywhere I've seen, they use that compact serialization form that, that we've seen on the, on the previous slide. This, this, this is uh, an overkill for, for most people. But let's, let's see it in action. So, uh, for example, here's my, uh, my Postman client. And I have an, uh, I have an application, a uh, Pixie app. Uh, it's a part of OWASP uh, DevSlops project. Uh, I can, uh, I call that login with username and password. I click send. It sends me back that token. It looks cryptic, but actually if I go to uh, jwt.io website, which is a wonderful site uh, maintained by uh, or zero, so I, I give a quick plug for them doing that. I just paste it in here, and you can see I didn't have to provide any encryption key or anything. It uh, decoded everything, now it says, uh, so that it's a symmetric algorithm signed, and here's all the information about that user that the application is returning, right? Again, it's not encrypted, anyone can see that. I, I didn't have to provide any, any key. Uh, to verify the signature, I would need to provide a key, right? So if I scroll down, right now it says that it, 
it cannot verify the signature. It knows the algorithm, but I need to provide the, the secret for this thing to be able to tell me, yes, it's legitimate or no, it's not legitimate. Because uh, remember, uh, the, the request could have contained the key to verify the signature in the header, but it's, it's not required. It's uh, optional. So this particular app doesn't do that, so I, I need to know the, the secret to be able to, to figure out whether it's uh, properly signed or not. OK, so what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Anything. <laughs> Anything, yes. So uh, uh, obviously, uh, now we live in that zero, zero trust environment, right? In, in most cases, people calling your API, calling your resource, are not necessarily leg legitimate access. Uh, you no longer, like in the, in the good old days, <laughs> in the good old days, our apps were relatively monolithic apps. Even the web apps were mostly server-side apps, right? The, the, the browser was just rendering HTML and all the logic, everything was on the server side. That's not the case anymore. We're in the world of mobile apps. We're in the world of single page application, web applications when everything is happening in the browser. We're in the world of uh, decomposed microservices. Again, you, you get API calls, you don't, you don't know whether they are from a trusted person or not. Uh, so let, let's see what can go wrong. So first of all, so yeah, I, I've mentioned that. You, as an API provider, you, should, you just don't, don't trust anyone. Right, you don't trust the caller. And so, um, and the weird thing is that JWT token, the way it was designed, put a lot of trust in the caller. And one of that, and the no obvious thing, is that one thing that we trust is that the whole algorithm thing, right? So we sort of, we just, so the caller tells you which algorithm they're using, and you as a consumer use that thing. But if you don't really trust that other person, then you should not probably trust that either. So there are some hacks based on that. The most obvious one is that we modify that. So remember, so I, I was, say I, I, was not, I was not an admin, but I want to be an admin. But I know that, that they won't let me be an admin, but they really want to. So I changed that is admin to true, but now my, my signature is, is invalid, right? Because I've changed the content, so the signature is now not valid anymore. So what I, can, what, what I can do is that I can remember that actually, remember that, that standard? It had many algorithms. It's what one of them was none, no algorithm. So I just changed that to none, and I no longer need a signature, right? And when I calculate the token based on that, that token doesn't have a signature, but it's a legitimate token. So now I can just send it, and if the, if the client just blindly verifies the token, uh, just saying, is it a legitimate token? It is a legitimate token. So basically, clients should not, more, actually most of the modern libraries, they explicitly prohibit none as they use, but you should verify that, especially if you do, do it yourself. Or if you use a library, again, make, make sure that it, it won't accept none as, as the algorithm at all. Uh, a more interesting attack is to change the algorithm not to none, but from asymmetric to symmetric. So let me tell you how that works. So uh, we have two classes of uh, encryption algorithms and algorithms for signing things, symmetric and asymmetric. Symmetric is when the same secret, the same key is used by both parties, right? So Sam is signing the token with the key, and then I have the same key, I have the same secret. Uh, we use whatever, my, my, his mother's maiden name as a secret, as a shared secret. And uh, he uses that secret to sign, and I use that secret to verify. Asymmetric is when I don't know what he is using to sign. He is using the private key to sign, but we all know his public key. His public key is well known to everyone, and that can be used to, to verify the, the signature. And so suppose we are using that asymmetric algorithm to sign. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's a more secure way to do things. So he is signing that with his secret key. So that's, that's a secret signed with secret key. So now attacker, when attacker changes that, the attacker doesn't know his key. So the attacker cannot, no one knows his private key. So attacker cannot really calculate a new signature. But what attacker does is the attacker changes 
the algorithm from asymmetric to symmetric. Um, however, uh, again, what do we use with the key? The attacker is a, is, a, is a weird one. The attacker takes the public key of Sam and uses that public key as a shared key for symmetric. So if my, if my code, if what my code does just takes the algorithm, takes Sam's public key, and verifies the signature, that would work. Because the algorithm changed, but the key that didn't change, right? So I'm using, I'm blindly using his public key. I think that I'm using asymmetric encryption. However, I'm using, in reality, my code might be using the algorithm from the token, and so I'm not using the algorithm that I think I'm using. And so I think that it's all right. I think that I verified the signature. However, no, I, I fell victim to, to the attack. Uh, or sometimes people don't, again, a lot of developers in a lot of, uh, in a lot of libraries, the decode method and the verify method are two different methods. So a lot of cases in their code, you would see that the developer is just calling the decode method and they decode and, and use the data. Again, that this should be a no-no. Obviously, signatures need to be verified. Uh, or they can, again, trust the signature. We talked about some weird cases, but sometimes, again, the standard allows you to just send signature in the, in the header. Again, a lot of li libraries, you would ask them to verify, and according to the standard, they will use that signature in the header, they will verify, but obviously attacker can send their own signature, so that doesn't buy you anything. It doesn't make that code, uh, that, that token any more legitimate. Um, also, if there are nested tokens, like you can have a token as part of the, uh, another token, obviously you need to in, uh, verify signature in each and every level, right? Because you cannot trust that, uh, whatever, that the first layer calling you that the second layer was correct and so on. Uh, also, in symmetric algorithm, remember when we use the shared key, that shared key needs to be something more complex than QWERTY. <laughs> so, uh, because basically the, the problem with that, and that's, that's one of the issues that uh, Louis was talking about yesterday, is that uh, anyone can get your token. Like remember that the token that actually streamed is just passed in all the calls. So if someone gets that, they can just take it offline. They know your algorithm because the algorithm is actually in the header. They can just take it offline and just run their computer using a dictionary attack, just trying to uh, sign the token with, with, with QWERTY, didn't work, sign it with password, didn't work, sign it with one, two, three, four, five, didn't work, and so on. So this, this should never be a word, right? This should be as random as possible, just a long random stream with good entropy. So uh, never, never ever use the passwords here. Okay. And keys can leak. Obviously, we all know that, right? So, uh, again, never ever have your keys in the GitHub or GitLab or anything, right? That they should not be part of your source code. Uh, not even in private repositories because private repositories can become public repositories at some point and backups can be somewhere, etc. So keys are, keys are a big deal, right? If, if someone gets your key, they can sign it saying anything. Uh, yes, and obviously that not just code repositories. Again, if you have your key on the server, make sure that no one can access that file on the server. Uh, it's a hardened server, no one gets access there. Uh, again, uh, cross site or whatever. A any attacks that can get a hold of your key is a bad thing. Then your, your, whole, your whole system that relies on the token is compromised at that point, right? Anyone can, can sign tokens on your behalf, can do anything. Um, another interesting, again, thing is that suppose you're not sending the key in your, so you should never send the key in the, in the header, but you can send the key ID. Remember we talked about if you have multiple keys, it's sort of safer to just say whatever, use key number five, key number three. So again, standard doesn't say what key ID is, and sometimes people use a file name, so suppose they have many keys, 
and they would send uh, the file name of that, of that key to be used. It's very easy for developer, right? You just take that file name or path and you, you have the key in your backend and you can verify the signature. However, uh, if you just blindly trust that, that can uh, lead you in trouble. For example, say I send something like that. <laughs> so I just got to the parent folder, parent folder, and now I got to some public information that anyone can, can see, whatever to your uh, CSS file or something. So obviously, if I use that uh, as a key uh, for, um, uh, for symmetric, then I, I, know <laughs> I know your key. You're going to be using the same data to verify the signature that I used uh, to sign it. Uh, keys, uh, if you use keys in SQL, again, something like that, you can get SQL injection, right? Basically, if you, if you have a SQL lookup for the key, uh, then uh, anyone can, uh, can, can hack you if you don't sanitize the thing. So basically, I send something like that. I, I send something that doesn't exist with a union with something that I like. And this thing gets evaluated to the word key. And then, again, I, I can get, get in. Uh, same thing with the file. Again, when I'm reading the file, I need to make sure that I'm reading the file with something that is safe. So if someone sends me uh, a command, uh, it doesn't get executed. Um, now we'll go, we'll, we'll talk about the, so that, that's about the content of the, of the token. Basically, the, with the content of the token, just don't, don't trust that, that content. Verify that everything is in line with what you expect before using them. Um, now with the actual use of the tokens. So suppose I have a legitimate, legitimate use. I have some system that trusts that um, identity provider. I got that key and I'm, I'm using to access that system. That, so that, that's the sort of the, the normal flow. Suppose there's another system that also trusts that same provider, right? So that, again, happens all the time if, if we talk about whatever. Everyone trusts in Facebook. That, that would be the typical situation of different companies trusting, trusting Facebook for, for the tokens. Or it can be even within your internal deployment. You have multiple services that trust the same identity provider. So suppose that's, that's a rogue user. And that user actually wants to go and access this these, uh, organization. So if, if my key only contains information that the user is Joe and his role is admin, and these two systems both happen to have a username Joe, and they both trust this guy, oh, this identity provider, then nothing prevents that uh, malicious user for using the token that he got for this organization and use it with this organization. Make sense? Yeah. So again, you need to make sure that, um, that this organization needs to know that the token that this user is using is not for this one, but for, for, for that one. And for that, there's, a, there's, a, there's an optional parameter audience that you can use, and then I would encourage you to use. And so your token should contain information about who the user is, who the identity provider is, but who the audience of that is as well. So you don't accidentally take the, uh, the token from that, uh, that was issued for someone else. Um, similar, similar kind of attack would be if suppose you have some, whatever, mail server and the finance server uh, within your company, and you, you send something, and, and you verify that it's, the audience is anything in your company, like whatever, my org uh, slash star. Again, don't do that. Don't use wildcards. Uh, you can easily get someone to use your token that was intended for one system to another system. Be, be specific. Wildcards are allowed, but should be discouraged. Or someone can just intercept, uh, intercept your token and reuse it. So for example, I, I want to access some tokens uh, that was issued for whatever, for Billy. I'm not Billy, but I, I just happen to have his token. Why, why shouldn't I use that token to, to just do anything on Billy's behalf? Uh, so that's obviously bad. So for that, you need to limit the tokens as much as you can. So uh, there's a way to produce timestamps, say when it was issued, say when it should expire. Uh, you should obviously set whatever audience and everything. There's a way to, to add just unique IDs to prevent tokens to be replayed. Use minimal scopes. 
again, don't don't use all powerful tokens. Try to use the tokens that are only specific for this service and only have the information. So worst case, if it leaks, again, the worst case scenario that they, they would use it within uh, within they were what they were supposed to use. Um, and make it specific to client as well, right? So if you have a way to identify the client, for example, it would have uh, embedded certificate. You can you can. Uh, use it with it, uh, you can tie it to the TLS connection or anything, use that as well, right? So another client could not use it. Now going back to opaqueness of the token, right? So we talked about the token uh, that the client should have no idea what the token is, right? However, in reality, if it's a JWT token, in reality a client, so a client is supposed to just send it over, but nothing prevents the client from being a rogue client and, and decoding it, right? So if your token contains some information that is sensitive, whatever, uh, credit card information, user birth date, wh wh whatever, is, is, uh, whatever is the information that you don't want to leak, whatever, his phone number or something, then this can leak if it's in a token and the client is a rogue client, right? Because it's not, it's not encrypted. So there are two, two main things that you can do about that. One thing is that you can use encryption. So we have less than 10 minutes, so we'll, we will not talk a lot about encryption. But basically, the same way that you can do sign-in, you can, you can do encryption. It, it's obviously, it costs something. It, there's more compute involved. Uh, but you can do, again, you can uh, add the encryption algorithm to the, uh, to the header, and you can use that algorithm to encrypt the key with which you can encrypt the, the, the payload later on. And it's a symmetric algorithm going to be used for encryption, but asymmetric for the, uh, for the key. But it doesn't matter. So basically, if you get something that has um, five parts and then and four dots, then uh, this, is, uh, this is an encrypted to token. Uh, so for example, uh, I have a developer account with uh, a Spanish bank, BBVA. So when I send... Uh, send a request, uh, this is the kind of key that I get from them. So that's uh, way longer. And you can say that they give me some unencrypted data outside of the key. So for example, they tell me my scopes and when it expires. But everything else, if, if I were to paste this into JWTIO, I, I wouldn't be able to, to get anything out of that. So done that. The other solution is, is to, to do different kind of tokens. And this is something that a company called Curity is, is promoting and that they've implemented. And they call it phantom tokens. So basically the idea is that you have the normal flow when you request your token from identity provider. However, that token, they say, well, make that token as, as, as silly as possible. Just give some sort of unique ID. So if the token leaks, the outside client doesn't get any information from it. However, then, uh, have some edge server that gets, that exchanges that token with a real token that has real information. And so then in, inside your application, inside your Kubernetes cluster, inside your network, you use a full token that has a lot of information about the user. Outside, it's something that if, if that leaks, it's just a temporary UID, no one cares, it's going to expire and then it's going to be a new one. So the advantage of that is obviously that you limit the exposure to the outside world of the information, the token. So you're limiting your exposure and the tech surface. The downside is that, well, obviously it's an extra, extra hop, right? So we are talked about that decoupling. Well, here, here we're not, not as decoupled anymore. So there, there are pros and cons. Uh, however, just keep that in mind. And obviously if you have an, another layer here, you could have token exchange happening multiple times and that, that's totally fine, and that's the way to have multiple layers of defense. Finally, uh, I love that quote from Abraham Maslow, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see uh, every problem as a nail, right? So uh, JWT might not be what you need in your application. Uh, one, uh, just yesterday, one vendor, a guy from one company was telling me that, for example, they tried putting everything in token, and most web servers have uh, 8 KB as a limit for HCP headers, and they, they ran out of space in HCP headers, right? So 
keep that in mind. You don't, because you have that tool at your disposal, doesn't mean you have to use it for everything and, and send all the information. Um, for example, uh, I've seen a lot of web applications now starting to use tokens as a cookie. Can be an overkill. Uh, maybe if you're doing a web application development, it might not be the right tool for you because it's, it's much larger. And in most cases, remember that the idea behind the tokens is that you have the state in the token, so you don't have to do database reads or whatnot. But most of the web applications, they would still use a database to load some information about the user and some customer-generated content and so on. And in, in that case, if you're going to be using a database anyway, then JWT makes no sense. You just need some ID of that, of that user, of the session, and the cookie is, is as good as a, as a token in a cookie. So it doesn't, doesn't buy you anything. And again, lots of modern web frameworks, they, they load users on any request anyway. So again, you have double, double loads without, and then double verification of signatures anyway, because cookies, again, cookies are protected regardless and, and so on. So it, it might not be the right, the right tool for you. So just don't, don't blindly use that technology because it's, it's cool and, and others are using. And again, so most likely to optimize things, you, you'll get better, uh, better ban for your, for your buck with caching and, and other side optimization. So let's uh, sort of uh, uh, go back to, to recommendations in general. Again, make sure secrets are kept as secrets, right? If, if your secrets leak, uh, your tokens are not good. Not good. Uh, make sure that, um, again, external communications are opaque. If you, if you cannot trust the client, don't trust the client. Right, and encrypt the data or minimize the data that you send. Um, make sure that you use, when you verify the tokens, you use the specs or use the library that uses the specs. Uh, so you actually verify that all the, all the fields are the way that they are supposed to be. If there's, there's a URL in the field, that URL uh, points to something trusted and not to a random domain. Uh, can be very tricky, especially, especially in cases when uh, you have some sort of multi-tenant deployments. Uh, Microsoft had that issue in, in Microsoft Online because someone could, could, get, uh, could, could host a website on Azure and get a domain name something dot azureapps.com and, and people use that to hack into Microsoft uh, login system, right? Because they, they could use a, a legitimate looking Microsoft domain that for, for some code very fine within Microsoft, whatever, whatever they call these days, Microsoft Passport, uh, whatever it is now, uh, it, it just uh, had some uh, URL, uh, the URL implementation where it was just checked for, for, the, for the end domain, for the top domain. So um, make sure you val validate everything. Finally, um, as a final thing, um, I'll talk about a little bit, two minutes, uh, on what um, Fort to Crunch, the company I work for, is, is doing in terms of externalizing uh, some of that verification process. So since we are doing API security and API firewalls, in API world, in the REST API world, there's actually a way to define your APIs programmatically as uh, what used to be called Swagger files, now it's called Open API files. And there you can basically define the API itself, all the paths, operations, parameters, their patterns, and so on. So what we have done for, for our customers is that we have added, so that, that format is extensible. So we've added extensions. So within the API definitions, people can define not just the API, but also JWT requirements. So they can say in that file, and it's just a YAML or JSON file, they can say that um, this, requires JWT, JWT is going to be passed as a header access token, it needs, to use, um, it needs to use RSA only, only that algorithm or whatever one of these two, and the, the key to verify that would be in the environment variable, that name, and, and so on. So basically the idea is that you can externalize the checks by having them um, within the API itself. So it's basically kind of security as a code approach uh, you can also do some JWT verification in, uh, uh, in uh, en Envoy, if you're using Envoy. So Envoy has a, a subset of that. So if you're already using Envoy, again, some of the JWT verification can be externalized to, to Envoy. So externalizing uh, your policies and your verification is obviously a good thing because you no longer have to trust each and every developer in your company to do each and every, each and every check. So ex externalize the checks as much as you can. Uh, whether it's in, in the 
external tools like API Firewall or, or Envoy um, or libraries that, that can be trusted and, and you just verify that it's a proper library used in a proper way. Um, there's going to be a bunch of links in the, in the slides uh, when, you, when you get them. Uh, other than that, we have uh, like three minutes for questions. <laughs> So, uh, thank you, Michu. If you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll hand you the mic. For encrypted content, is it okay to use the same uh, key for encrypting the content and signature validation? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, excellent question. Uh, so, the, the good thing about encrypted tokens, JWT tokens, is that the encryption algorithms supported by the standard actually have uh, encryption and, and signatures and, and um, verification within the same algorithm. So actually when you use encrypted token, you do not have to use a different algorithm to, to sign. Okay. So it, the same key. It, it's going to be the same key and it's going to be within that, uh, within that long five, um, five, yeah, okay, here it is. Come on. Oops. So this, this thing would have authentication tag. And basically, uh, in just one go, you, you, when you encrypt it, you get both the encrypted content and you get the, the signature within one go. And then uh, when you receive the token, again, within, within one decryption, you both decrypt the, the payload and verify the signature. So you don't risk someone just messing around and, and somehow accidentally coming with a valid Payload with invalid signature. That's not possible. So the second solution that you gave was the phantom keys. Yeah. It's phantom tokens. Sorry. So how how does the tokens map to JWT? How is the mapping of one to another? Okay. So basically, the mapping has to happen somewhere in the identity provider. Is it a standard way to map it? Or it's it's not a standard thing. Okay. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an approach rather than standard. Okay. It's just an approach saying don't send the whole information, send some kind of identifier, and then have your own code that would somehow have a mapping between that identifier and the thing. But don't use, the, don't use permanent identifier. Use some, some kind of temporary identifier. So if this thing leaks, it's good for whatever, for five minutes or whatever, whatever it is. But you have that mapping internally. Well, thank you so much. Yeah.